I don't want to record. Whoops. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we will be beginning at 1 p.m. Eastern time uh, as we're waiting. I just want to let everyone know for the presentation, we will be in listen-only mode. Also, on the right-hand side, you will have the ability at the end of the presentation to type in questions under questions. Also, we do have handouts from today's presentation. We have the PowerPoint and PDF, as well as other handouts from AFA. Again, we will begin at 1 p.m. and this presentation will be in listen-only mode. Thank you.
Hi, good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to Care Connection, our free live webinar the second Thursday of each month. Before we begin today's presentation, I would like to let everyone know that on the right hand side, you will see um, the ability to type in questions and to have our handouts. Um, this presentation will be in listen only mode. So at the end of the presentation, certainly you could type in your questions and retrieve the handouts. Today's presentation will be in PDF under handouts. I'd like to welcome today Sarah Dulaney, who is a geriatric clinical nurse specialist at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center in San Francisco, California, where she helps implement the CARE Ecosystem Study, a supportive clinical trial testing the effect of a personalized education, support, and care navigation intervention for persons with dementia and their caregivers. She has over 15 years of experience working with adults with cognitive impairment and dementia in community, hospital, and long-term care settings. Sarah is passionate about working towards better care and support for persons with dementia and their caregivers. Today, she will be talking about potential risks and benefits of hospitalizations for people with dementia. So Sarah, it is your turn to now begin. Thank you. Great, thank you for this opportunity. Um, it's an important topic and uh, happy to present on this topic. So um, yeah, we'll just go ahead and get started. Our learning objectives are listed here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. One thing I wanna point out is that when I look at the literature, um, hospitalizations among persons with dementia um, it fo tends to focus on people who live in the community, people who live in nursing homes or long-term care settings, and the people in the last year of their life. And so the bulk of what I'm going to focus on are people who live in the community, um, because that's where the majority of people with dementia live, and that's the majority of people that I work with um, at this point. So. Um, in general, the, having a diagnosis of dementia is associated with increased hospital use. Um, looking at Medicare claims data and comparing it um, among people living with and without dementia, um, someone having dementia is 74% 70, more likely to be hospitalized, and they're also more likely to use the ED. Um, and among both groups that with or without dementia, there is a sharp increase in hospitalization hospitalizations in the last year of life. Um, just, um, we're not gonna get into the last year of life, but just wanna make sure people are aware of that. Um, and when we look at the reasons why people with dementia are hospitalized, um, a lot of the data comes from looking at Medicare claims for people who are in longitudinal research studies. And so, um, you know, research participants uh, tend to be um, Caucasian and have higher level of education. Um, so I just want to point out that it doesn't necessarily reflect the um, demographics of the general population. Um, so, but having a high comorbidity was actually significantly associated with increased risk of hospitalization. Um, those are comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, particularly heart failure and COPD, which is uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, basically chronic lung disease. Um, in this group of people, this is just looking at people who had dementia, um, the number one reason for hospitalization was basically falls, syncope is passing out um, or trauma. And um, we know falls are more common in people who have cognitive impairments and also um, more common in older adults. So that's an important risk factor. Um, ischemic heart disease, like heart attacks, gastrointestinal disease, you know, could be an ulcer, bleeding ulcer, um, diarrhea kind of infection, um, pneumonia, and delirium or, or mental status change. Um, so that's where you might see, you know, psychotic behaviors. Um, these reasons for, this is again, Medicare data. 
um, looking at people who had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease based on claims data. So probably missing a lot of um, people since we know a lot of people go undiagnosed. Um, and this is looking m separated into all cause hospitalizations and then those that were considered prevent potentially avoidable. So um, that's there's criteria from the AHRQ that says, you know, some of these hospitalizations would be avoidable if people had access to better outpatient care. Um, and so 14% of all cause hospitalizations were considered preventable. Um, and one in five patients were readmitted within 30 days. So that's an important um, quality indicator for hospitals. And I think, you know, the way that I interpret that is that people are maybe being discharged when they're not ready or not being, uh, you know, the discharge planning is, is not uh, adequate to help these people transition and uh, continue to recover in the outpatient setting. Um, most of the readmissions were associated with hospitalizations for heart failure, lung disease, and pneumonia. Um, and, you know, looking at this pie chart here, that might um, be a reflection in the fact that the infections, heart failure, and lung disease take up the bulk of that um, pie chart. Um, so you might think that being in an integrated health system like Kaiser here in California or Group Health uh, would be associated with fewer potentially preventable um, hospitalizations and thinking that, uh, you know, an integrated model might uh, better manage chronic comorbidities, but they actually found that 28% of hospitalizations were also considered potentially preventable and two thirds of those were also associated with pneumonia, heart failure, and um, urinary tract infections. And this is data actually coming from Australia, um, looking at falls and older adults. And um, you know the, the thing that you wanna avoid with falls are obviously injuries. And people, older adults with dementia were significantly more likely to be injured than um, people who fall when they don't have dementia. Um, the most serious injuries associated with falls and um, largely because they're associated with disability and mortality are hip fracture and head injury. Um, and in both cases, people with dementia are at higher risk for getting those injuries. They're actually at less risk um, for upper limb, upper limb fractures. Um, that uh, typically happens you know, when you try to protect yourself from a fall and break your wrist. Um, so, you know, perhaps people with dementia are less able to protect themselves to try to break the fall, and, and that's the reason why they're less likely to have upper limb fractures. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, these um, injuries are associated with higher mortality, um, and people with dementia were more than twice as likely to die within 30 days of an injury-related hospitalization, though the overall percent is, um, you know, fairly low. Um, so falls are, you know, we take them very seriously in, among older adults and also especially with people with dementia. Um, for those working with people with dementia, we are always aware of, um, you know, behavior related challenges. And I thought it was really interesting. This is looking at, um, again, participants in um, a research study. Um, analyzing their claims data. And actually, psychotic behavioral symptoms related to dementia. So these are things that are usually distressing, like delusions, hallucinations, agitation, and aggression, were actually related to fewer ED visits overall. Um, and when they did a sensitivity analysis to kind of better understand that, they found that um, this is was associated with people in the advanced stage. So that makes sense. Um, you know, clinically that, you know, when people are in the later stage, the caregiver might have gotten used to this, they might under expect it, be better able to manage um, this kind of behavior. Um, however, higher levels of caregiver distress, so the data was coming from the MPIQ, which is an inventory of um, 
behaviors associated with dementia, and then the caregivers rate how much distress they have in association with these um, behaviors. So caregivers who endorse the higher level of distress and related to these psychotic symptoms, there was significantly increased um, ED visits as well as hospitalization. So um, I think it's important more and more that we look at not just the, what's going on with the person, but also what's going on with the caregiver, um, because we know the caregiver well-being is really um, highly associated with outcomes for the person with dementia. Um, and this data is actually surveys and interviews with caregivers, so it's not looking at claims data. Um, people who were recruited from the community, I believe this is in Ohio, um, they did three interviews over a six month period and looked at those who um, reported hospitalizations. Um, these categories are a bit weird. I'm not sure why they combined dehydration and behavioral outbursts into one category, but um, you can see infections were basically the top reason for hospitalizations and falls um, were a significant reason for ED visits as well as GI symptoms. Um, and the interesting thing about this study is they actually had a checklist of, I think it was 44 symptoms um, common among older adults, and they did an analysis to see what were the symptoms that the caregivers reported observing in the person with dementia that had a significant association um, with ED visits or hospitalizations. Um, so blood pressure concerns, pressure ulcers, uh, you know, more common in the later stages hallucinations and delusions and skin injuries um, may be associated with falls, may be associated with burns, um, may be associated with just having thin skin, um, suspected UTI and voice and speaking problems. I thought it was interesting, you know, they can take guesses as to why this, these were, um, you know, associated with ED visits and hospitalizations, perhaps voice and speaking problems are a sign that someone may be developing swallowing problems and be more at risk for pneumonia. Um, also depression um, was associated with ED visits and hospitalizations and depression is also associated with institutionalization. So um, I think these are all um, symptoms that you know we might wanna pay more attention to, ask about, look for. Um, and it, so talking about the risks of hospitalization, um, you know, hospitals are not designed to, um, you know, be the best environment for people with dementia. People with dementia are higher risk for delirium. So that's an acute um, change in condition, fluctuating um, confusion, level of consciousness. Um, this usually has an underlying medical cause and is associated with negative outcomes. So accelerated cognitive decline, people often don't get back to their baseline um, after the, having a delirium. They, are, they also have risk for um, functional decline and increased risk of institutionalization and, um, and actually mortality within one year. And um, hospitalization also leads to significant loss of function and mobility in it. This study looked at um, the level of cognitive impairment. So um, on these graphs on the right, you can see the dark line is someone who didn't have any cognitive impairment admission. They did a simple um, cognitive test when people were admitted um, and you know, uh, put them in different quarta or groups based on their cognitive performance. So people with severe cognitive impairment you know, didn't have very high independent activities of daily living function on admission. So not surprising that that stayed low, same with ADL function. But when you look at their mobility down at the bottom, um, you know, they're really not recovering uh, mobility. That's a pretty big drop in mobility. Um, so for someone with more severe cognitive impairment, you know, you're thinking their caregiver is transferring them in and out of bed, helping them transfer maybe to the bathroom. And if this, they're losing that mobility, that's making the caregiver's job a lot harder. So, um, you know, I think when we're looking at uh, the impact this has on someone's life and uh, whether it's okay for them to stay at home, um, 
you know, hopefully we can avoid this, this kind of significant drop. Um, and again, looking at reasons for institutionalization, this is in nursing homes, um, you know, when a caregiver is older or has poor health themselves, when they're burdened, stressed, or feeling trapped, um, the person they care for is more likely to um, be moved to a home and also the level of cognitive and functional impairment. So people with uh, more advanced stage dementia are more likely um, to be moved to a nursing home as, as well as people who have behavioral symptoms or depression or live alone. And um, this is where, you know, I wanted to point out that though you don't see this necessarily in um, the literature, in my experience, um, hospitalizations can often be a gateway for institutionalization. So when a caregiver is feeling trapped or realizing that, you know, they really are not able to care for someone safely at home anymore, um, there are a lot of barriers, especially for middle and lower income um, families to accessing long-term care and um, hospitalization is often, um, you know, a way to go about that. And I apologize for uh, the phone beeping. Um, so um, this is a model of, um, this team looked at um, people in longitudinal research studies at the Alzheimer's disease research centers across the country and sort of modeled um, what the course of their care looks like over the course of the disease. So this is modeling for someone who's diagnosed at 83 years old and over 10 years of living with dementia, you can see the value of informal care is the, the dark um, band at the bottom. So just looking at, you know, how much caregivers are doing, um, the row above that is the amount of out-of-pocket spending. Um, and the top two lighter um, pieces of the bar are Medicaid and Medicare expenditures. So there's, you know, a little bit more Medicare and Medicaid expenditures um, at the end of life, maybe associated with hospice or nursing home um, care, but really families, um, are providing the bulk of care over the course of the disease. And, um, you know, I think that's often underappreciated. Um, so I just want to point that out. Um, so the hospital environment, as I said, is disorienting at, for people with dementia, which increases the risk for delirium. And um, there's a lot of things in the environment that limit mobility. So um, people will be on oxygen, um, they'll have IV fluids and poles, you know, those um, compression um, devices on their legs, so they don't get um, uh, DVTs. They're often, you know, considered a fall risk, and so they're not able to get out of bed on their own, they have alarms. Um, and so they're basically spending most of the time in bed, which is going to lead to muscle loss and increased weakness and further exacerbate their risk for falls. Um, there's often not very much room in a hospital uh, room. Sometimes they have a chair at the bedside, sometimes they don't. So even if the person was able to get out of bed, they might not have anywhere to go. Uh, if they need to use a mobility device like a walker, those aren't always easily available. Um, there's not necessarily a place to walk um, that's safe, um, and there's a lot of noise. People can get disoriented not knowing what time of day it is. They often are not um, able to use their glasses and hearing aids, so they're not understanding their, you know, they're not getting the right sensory input. Um, and there's really no reason to get out of bed because there's nowhere to go. Um, and so unless their family is there visiting, um, there's really not a lot of, um, you know, meaningful social engagement. Um, in addition to just environmental factors, um, you know, hospitalizations are associated, they'll um, make, add medications, um, not necessarily review what they're taking, um, not necessarily communicate with the PCP. Um, so depending on 
you know, how on top of it the caregiver is, how much they're able to advocate. Um, if, you know, a lot of times people don't really know um, what medications people are getting when they're in the hospital and, um, you know, what the changes are when they go home. Um, undernutrition and dehydration are something that I see a lot, um, particularly undernutrition in that, um, you know, the, the staff will put a tray of food, maybe it has a cover on it, um, on the bedside table and leave it there. And, you know, that's not how the person normally eats. Um, they're often, the staff don't have time to give the assistance that's needed or they don't recognize the need. And so people um, can really lose weight and, and frankly lose the ability to feed themselves if they were able to do that um, before. And, um, you know, weight loss in dementia is significant um, and can be hard to make up for. Um, as uh, same with, you know, increased dependence, inco incontinence um, often can happen if people end up, you know, they're not getting help to the bathroom on a regular basis, they're stuck in bed. So, um, again, you know, if someone was independent to the bathroom before they went in the hospital and they come out incontinent, that's going to have a significant impact on the caregiver. Um, and, you know, typically discharge planning, um, you know, there's, it's sort of done kind of last minute and often in a rush. So it's easier if someone has higher needs to basically send them to a rehab facility and kind of let the rehab facility figure out how to get them home as opposed to uh, coordinating with the PCP and the home health and um, the caregiver to make sure, you know, they have the equipment and the help they need for the person to be able to go home. And in general, um, you know, if, if the home environment is safe, I think it's better um, as much as possible for the person to go back to a familiar environment with familiar people um, uh, as soon as possible. Um, <clears throat> As I mentioned before, with the preventable hospitalizations, the quality of outpatient care is associated with hospital use. Um, and one indicator of quality of care is how many providers the, the patient sees. Um, so people who see a lot of providers or have a low continuity of care or more have higher ED and hospital use. Um, and, you know, as a confounder, they also tend to have more comorbidities. So um they are sicker um may have uh, they also actually happen to be um higher educated and have a higher income um so uh, having access to more specialty care um may not necessarily be a good thing um if you know there's not coordination between providers and there's you know in general it's thought that the PCP or you know, whoever is um, kind of managing the main um, illness the person has is, is sort of the gatekeeper or help coordinating care among other people because in general people, providers are unlikely to change a medication someone else prescribed and so someone can get, um, but, they, but they'll add a new medication so people can get medications they don't need, it leads to polypharmacy and um, negative outcomes. Um, barriers to good primary care for patients. This is quality interviews with primary care providers in Northern California. I'm sure this is would sound familiar to anyone anywhere in the United States. Um, time constraints. So typical office visits are limited to 15 minutes. That's simply not adequate for an older adult with multiple comorbidities in addition to dementia. Um, providers are frustrated with inadequate reimbursement. Um, you know, there's not a lot of, um, there's not necessarily increased reimbursement for taking care of more complicated patients. And when you try to do that, there's, you know, complicated billing mechanisms. You have to document things in a complicated way and, and that can be a burden on providers. Um, the providers also say that, you know, they end up managing things they don't really feel qualified to manage because it's so hard to for their patients to get access to specialty neuro neurology or psychiatric care. Um, so they might be, you know, prescribing antipsychotics, for example, for someone with a lot of behaviors um, without really kind of having a lot of experience or expertise in that area. 
Um, and, you know, doctors are not trained as social workers, so they don't aren't familiar with community-based services that are really essential to good dementia care um, and, you know, don't have the time necessarily to, to learn about those services. And a lot of primary care practices don't have interdisciplinary teams. Um, and, you know, even if they might have a social worker, that person may not be trained in um, geriatrics or dementia. So they might not be as familiar with the services that are really helpful um, to supporting people at home. Um, and a systematic review of basically dementia care interventions. Um, this study found that they really didn't have a significant impact on um, reducing hospitalizations or ED use. Um, and based on their findings, they made some um, recommendations about, you know, if you want to try to help reduce hospitalizations, um, these are things that you should try to target. I think most of these interventions were targeted at supporting caregivers, um, teaching them about the, um, you know, dementia and, you know, providing social support and connecting them with social services as opposed to a focus on, um, you know, medical issues. So improving management of co comorbid illness, particularly heart failure, COPD and diabetes. Um, and as part of that, you know, working to simplify medication regimens to help um, people, you know, take them more reliably, um, working with families to prevent injuries due to falls and burns, um, and the targeting the education to teaching people about infections and risks for, for being hospitalized. So, um, you know, infections like urinary tract infections, pneumonia, dehydration, constipation, diarrhea, and pain, uh, you know, what are the signs of that so that people can um, seek outpatient care um, before the condition worsens. Um, providing 24-7 access to telephone nurse triage and also facilitating advanced care planning um, and not just completing, you know, advanced directives and calling it done, but, you know, really revisiting the, the discussions around um, what are the person's goals as their condition changes, what, what kind of care would they want, you know, what is their, what do they consider good quality of life. Um, and so now I'm, I just, uh, when I looked at this data and then was thinking about the people that I care for, um, I was um, just thinking, you know, are preventable hospitalizations for patients with multiple comorbidities really preventable? Um, in the case of Mary, she's 99 years old. She has heart failure, kidney failure, COPD, as well as dementia. Um, she lives at home with her daughter, who's actually a retired ICU nurse. Um, her daughter's, I, I can't imagine someone taking better care of this woman. She does an excellent job, um, very attentive and um, highly skilled. Um, her mom attends a day program five days a week. Um, she enjoys her quality of life. She loves the dog, um, enjoys uh, watching certain TV shows and, and likes to drink beer. Um, and her daughter's really hoping to help her mom to live to be 100. Um, so she's not at the point of, um, you know, we've had discussions about hospice and she hasn't felt that um, this is what her mom would want at this time. Um, and she has, you know, a, a great geriatrician um, as well as a cardiologist, a kidney specialist, and a pulmonologist. Um, and she's had a lot of hospitalizations. Um, she actually recently had a hospitalization for fluid overload due to heart failure. Um, I mean, as you can see, her hospitalizations are consistent with the findings. Um, and I actually talked to her daughter about, um, you know, was there something that could have been done differently? And, and we talked about the challenge that you know, for people with heart failure and kidney failure, um, it's it's hard to manage the fluid balance. So, um, 
you know, she needs to drink enough water so that she doesn't damage her kidneys due to dehydration and she needs to not drink too much um, or, you know, um, take too many diuretics um, to damage her kidneys. And then she needs to not drink too much so she doesn't get fluid in her lungs. Um, and her daughter did say that apparently her mom had been complaining for a couple of weeks before her hospitalization um, that she just wasn't feeling well. Um, and that's a really nonspecific um, thing. She, she wasn't, she didn't really take it too seriously. And um, unfortunately, a couple of weeks later, she ended up um, in the hospital and, you know, got an infection and was there for 10 days. And, um, you know, is now going to need a lot of rehab to regain her strength. But, um, you know, I, I think it's just important, you know, when you look at the claims data, it sounds so simple. Oh, just better heart failure management. But when you're talking about someone who's 99 years old and has multiple things going on, um, you know, it's it's pretty complicated. And we can't assume that um, that life for someone like her is is not worth living. You know, that's a really individual um, value judgment. Um, so risks for falls related to dementia. Um, I wanted to bring up the executive dysfunction that we see, um, you know, impulsivity, poor judgment, and inability to multitask. So at our at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center, um, we see a lot of people with frontotemporal dementia, which is one of the most common um, early onset um, types of dementia. And something that's common in people with uh, FCD is an obsessive compulsivity. So, um, and also just, you know, poor judgment um, and social dysfunction. Um, the um, person I have in mind was really, um, you know, compulsive about um, pruning her um, fruit trees. She had been a gardener and um, would find the ladder and climb up and, you know, reach to the top branch and, uh, you know, her husband ended up having to hide the ladder and get different clippers so that because she ended up falling and, and breaking her wrist. And then, um, again, they were, I think, traveling somewhere. And um, he was talking to her as they were going down the stairs. And I think this is something for caregivers to really be aware of is that, you know, if somebody is walking, uh, you know, we can walk and talk at the same time. And that's not a problem. But someone with dementia, you know, if they're eating, if they're walking, if they're doing anything that takes any kind of, if they're doing a task, uh, they kind of need to be able to focus on that task. So anyway, they were walking down the stairs and she talking and she was distracted and fell and um, ended up breaking a tooth. And um, later was, um, you know, at home and her daughter had come to visit and her daughter brought her dog. Um, and the, you know, dog sort of matched the floor <laughs> And the, um, she didn't see the dog and tripped over the dog and had another fall. So, um, you know, it, I think falls in dementia can really take a lot of vigilance in, um, you know, thinking of what might happen. You know, it can be really challenging to get people to use assistive devices. Um, and, um you know, visual problems are very common, especially depth perception with stairs um, or really patterned floors um, that um, people are, you know, if they're getting up at night to go to the bathroom, um, falling going to the bathroom at night is also very common. There's autonomic dysfunction um, that's common in Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, that causes a sudden drop in blood pressure um, that can be pretty unpredictable. So someone can just be standing there and then just, you know, have their blood pressure drops and they just fall to the ground. Um, it's, uh, you know, unless you put someone in a wheelchair, which is going to make them weaker and also decrease their function, it can be really difficult to 
um, prevent these um, falls. You know, they often have to, you know, sometimes take salt tablets and medications to increase their blood pressure um, and their blood pressure can really fluctuate. Um, so you really, that requires some specialty level consultation. Um, weakness, gait and balance problems, also very common um, with age and also with dementia. Um, the constant pacing um, or people who tend to wander, um, you know, that, that's going to increase, and basically being mobile <laughs> um, is going to increase your risk for falling. And the thing with pacing is that you, you're it's sort of a compulsive behavior. You're not necessarily using good judgment in where you're pacing. Um, so people can get kind of stuck in a place that's not safe. Um, and, you know, wandering, anybody who's left home alone um, and who is able to get around, um, I worry about wandering and it's really easy to get disoriented um, and, you know, seriously lost. And um, if you're lost, for a while and not found, you're going to be dehydrated and can get weakened. We've had people where this happened, where they fell and broke their hip. Um, and so that's another thing to look out for. Um, medication side effects and toileting issues, I think, are common for people with and without dementia, especially older adults. Um, so if someone does have a lot of falls, you want to check um, the medications, work with a pharmacist or the doctor to check the medications. Um, and freezing is also similar to the sudden drop in blood pressure specific to Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. Um, and you can work with a movement disorders specialist to see if there's, uh, you know, adjustment to their medications to help with that. Sometimes um, using music or um, certain, you know, cues um, can help um, people with freezing, but it's another, um, you know, thing that can come on suddenly or, and be unpredictable. Um, so I think with falls, it's sort of a balance of balancing the risks and um, balancing independence. Um, and that's, uh, I think, a uh, not an easy decision to make. I think caregivers and people living with dementia um, face a lot of these kinds of decisions. But just to be aware of what the main, you know, risks for injuries are advanced age, uh, fragile bones or osteoporosis, um, uh, it, having a history of falls and taking blood thinners. So um, if someone is on a blood thinner and, um, you know, they have a lot of falls, make sure the doctor uh, knows that they have a lot of falls and maybe they will want to adjust the blood thinner um, or choose an alternative. Um, also, you know, if someone has low vitamin D, they might want a vitamin D supplementation. Uh, and just again, to illustrate, um, you know, I think sometimes when you see these reasons for hospitalization, you might feel like, oh, I'm failing. I didn't prevent this from happening. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it's really complicated. So here's another um, family, um, Gil's in his 70s. He really was very mildly impaired um, when he had his first fall. They were visiting um, family and he was playing basketball with his grandsons. Unfortunately, he fell and broke his hip. Um, the hip was repaired with pins. Um, and really his whole family. So he became delirious every night. Uh, you know, he had a short rehab stay and then went home and, um, you know, they basically were sleeping at the side of his bed to keep him from falling out of bed at night. Um, and when you have a hip replacement, often there are mobility restrictions about, you know, how you extend or, or bend your leg. And obviously he was not able to remember those restrictions. Um, so this was an exhausting effort um, really for, I think, uh, it's like a month or more of the family, you know, holding vigil at his bedside uh, to keep him from, from falling. Um, unfortunately, within the next year, the, he, the 
pins had become dislodged and he had to have, go through this whole thing again, basically. And each time, um, you know, he became more impaired. Um, in particular, his appetite has really gotten worse with each um, hospitalization and as well as his cognition. Um, so uh, again, he did eventually fall out of bed and that resulted in a vertebral compression fracture, which is very painful. Um, luckily though, he's able to recover at home um, with pain management and in-home rehab. Um, however, you know, over the course of what, two years, he's, he has really declined. Um, I think much faster than um, would have been expected had this not happened. Um, in spite of really heroic efforts, I think on uh, you know the part of his wife and his children who really um, have t taken turns and, and helped a lot in this case. Um, so for preventing infections in persons with dementia, um, you know making sure that people know, especially for women, when you're providing um, incontinence care, they're at higher risk for infection. So wiping from front to back and keeping people clean. Um, helping people with oral care is something that's often neglected, um, but especially with people who have any kind of swallowing difficulty, who cough when they drink fluids, um, it's important to keep the bacterial load in the mouth uh, low. Um, getting pneumonia and flu vaccines. Um, for people who live alone or um, maybe spend some time alone, really checking their fridge and making sure that the food is not spoiled. Um, that, you know, we do work with some people who live alone and, um, you know, they need some help with um, food safety is, as well as nutrition, if someone's not eating, um, they're anemic, that's going to affect their immune function. Um, staying hydrated, uh, especially it seems like when people go on vacation, um, maybe they're not paying attention to what the person's drinking or, uh, you know, a hot day, if they're out and about doing things, but really trying to pay attention um, to help the remind the person to drink fluids um, and keeping the person active um, will help them you know breathe more deeply and uh, keep their um, help prevent lung infections um, signs of delirium to look out for uh, any I, this is tricky um, particularly in people who have Lewy body dementia because the symptoms of Lewy body dementia fluctuate already so people's level of um, you know energy and awareness can fluctuate over the course of the day their level of insight and the cognitive abilities can really fluctuate um, but anytime that you see a sudden change like in a matter of days or weeks uh, it's a good idea to um, check in with a medical provider, um, particularly if they're, you know, I, I think most people, if someone is, has a new, you know, hallucinations or delusions and, and they're psych psychotically agitated, that's gonna be a, a easier trigger. Um, but sometimes people can just get really uh, slow or um, grog, kind of groggy. Um, or just it seems like they're just a little bit off, not able to do things um, like they used to. If, if that's sort of a, a noticeable change that seems like it's not just, um, you know, part of the normal progression, it's a good idea to uh, think about, well, A, did you give them an allergy medication? Did you give them something to help them sleep, like Benadryl? Uh, that can cause delirium. Um, but, uh, you know, we often see um, infections and especially UTIs um, and dehydration, um, sometimes constipation or pain um, and um, metabolic disturbance as well. So like um, electrolyte or anemia or um, thyroid issues. So 
getting that checked out is a good idea. Um, and when someone does is recovering from a hospitalization, just you know, similar as I described with Gil when he was recovering from the hip fracture, you're going to need to increase the supervision and support. Um, try to get them back into their normal routine as much as possible. If they're in ho the hospital, we work with the team to try to get them out of bed, you know, in the chair for meals, try not to feed them in the bed or help them eat, you know, in the bed. Um, really pay attention to food and fluid intake. This is can be a burden on families um, when hospital staff aren't able to uh, give people the help they need. Um, and, you know, keep the person socially engaged or talk with them. Um, and just be aware that, you know, it often takes a lot longer for someone with dementia to recover um, from a delirium, an infection or hospitalization, and, and they are likely will not return all, you know, get all the way back up to their baseline. Um, so I've put resources for information. This is, these are, um, information resources with, you know, family and patient friendly um, um, educational resources. So um, the first three have information specific to dementia and also, um, you know, common illnesses um, like pneumonia, urinary tract infections, um, falls. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association has a pretty great uh, two-page home safety checklist for people with dementia, I really like. And the um, Lung Association and the Heart Association both have um, interesting or simple kind of self-management handouts for heart failure and COPD. So if someone you care for has um, either of those illnesses, um, they're you know designed as like red, yellow, green. Um, and so you know it helps you evaluate where you are in terms of um, managing those diseases, and the CDC has some great um, handouts for um, preventing falls. And um, that is the I have the rest of my slides are references, um, and I am happy to answer any questions anybody may have. Thank you. This was an excellent presentation, and so we do have some questions. Um, this question was from the beginning of your presentation. Um, I think when you were talking about some of the studies, she wanted to know, does this data include inpatient psych hospitalizations? Um, the study on the behaviors um, did look at psych hospitalizations, but these are just claims data. Um, so I'm not sure that those are separated. Um, but in my experience, uh, it's a lot, unless someone has a primary mental health or mental illness um, diagnosis, it's very difficult to get someone with dementia um, hospitalized in a psychiatric hospital. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the uh, questions is, sh uh, she wanted you to share the information on the study you are currently conducting with Alzheimer's individuals and their caregivers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, well, I'm a part of the team. Um, the principal investigator is Kate Pocine, and we're currently working on um, our first um, outcome uh, publication, so I'm not able to share results, but um, basically we got funding in 2014 um, from Medicare through a Healthcare Innovation Award um, to provide telephone-based um, care navigation. So we have um, unlicensed um, people who we provide training um, about dementia, and they're part of um, they're supported by a team that includes um, myself, or and we have another advanced practice nurse, um, a social worker, and a pharmacist who specialize in geriatrics and dementia. And so the the navigators are the primary point of contact with usually the caregiver, because a lot of times the person with dementia 
um, is not able to talk on the phone a lot. Um, so they follow up monthly, uh, depending on the person's needs. If they don't have a lot of needs, they might, you know, talk to them uh, less frequently. They screen for issues. So they um, screen for behavior issues. They screen for uh, safety risks and, um, you know, provide a lot of education um, about the particular disease the person has and how the caregiver find resources and, you know, navigate public benefits that they might qualify for. Um, and then any issue that is something that's sort of um, beyond their scope, um, you know, we have a database of educational materials that they're able to draw from. We have a weekly meeting with our interdisciplinary team um, where we discuss cases and do a lot of brainstorming. Um, but anything that's beyond their scope um, is triage basically to the interdisciplinary team often the nurse um, if it's any kind of medical or behavioral issue um, and the social worker helps with um, you know a lot of depression and then also social service and public benefit needs and then the pharmacist does an initial screen of all of the meds a review of all the meds um, and helps with both accessing if there's issues with paying for medication um, and then determining, you know, ways to simplify or better optimize the, the medication regimen. So because it's telephone based, we are able to serve people across the state of California. We have a partner site at University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, and they have a parallel team over there that provides care um, to people over the phone in Nebraska as well as Iowa. Um, it's a, you know, a grant funded project. We Kate received a, um, a grant from the NIH to continue um, part of the, the per cohort of participants to look at longitudinal outcomes. So we have funding for the next five years um, to see, measure the impact both on um, patient and caregiver outcomes as well as healthcare utilization. So looking at EDUs, hospitalizations, and um, nursing home use. And there have been similar um, studies, I should say. You know, we were um, very influenced by the work at UCLA with their dementia care management program, um, the Healthy Aging Brain Care program at Indiana, Mind at Home at Johns Hopkins, and the NYU caregiver um, intervention I think that uh, Middleman um, in New York has been doing for many years. Um. Thank you so much. Um, one of the uh, listeners actually really appreciated that you mentioned about bacterial load and mouth. It was suggested mm -hmm. that caregiver help patient brush teeth and after every meal in order to avoid patient even aspirating saliva to avoid pneumonia. So she really appreciated that you mentioned that. She says, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, another question is, which tests are commonly used with people with dementia to assess cognitive function? Hmm. Um, so, well, it depends on where you go, but a common screening tests, I would say, are the um, MMSE or the MOCA. Um, I think the MOCA is becoming more commonly used, um, you know, but I, I think a diagnosis of dementia is not just about um, how they perform on the cognitive test. It's also how their cognition affects function and then also ruling out other causes. Um, so uh, I think it's important to actually get an evaluation um, if there's any concern about um, dementia, and I encourage um, if someone lives alone and they're concerned about their own cognition um, to reach out and, and find someone who can um, go to the appointment with them who might be able to verify, um, you know, their, their function, I think. Um, it's important to have a partner in, on this journey. <laughs> And I'm not sure if I answered the person's question, um, but in the particular study that um, where they did a cognitive test on, on admission in the hospital, they used the 
short portable um, mental status questionnaire. I think it's a 10 item questionnaire that's just verbal. Um, that's, uh, you know, a really gross measure. I mean, it, I think um, I, I wouldn't use that for diagnosis. <laughs> Right, and I think also recognizing, you know, these um, ment many, you know, these many mental exams. While they're helpful, that's not um, all that one should be doing in terms of getting an evaluation. It's getting their blood worked up. It's seeing a neurologist and having some sort of brain scan. Sometimes it's including, uh, you know, different specialists uh, in the process. So um, I think yeah. we both covered that question. Um, we do have another question. Do you know if respite settings are beneficial for these patients? Um, so did you say respite settings? Yes. Um, I think respite care is very important. Um, under the bucket of respite care, I would con I would include in-home care, like anything that gives the caregiver a break. Um, and I think I, I tried to include uh, literature that demonstrates that, you know, how the caregiver is doing is directly associated with how the patient does. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's really important that caregivers get a break. I think it's, I think it's really hard um, to figure out the best way to do that. And so it's really important to reach out in your community to organizations like Alzheimer's Foundation, the Alzheimer's Association, Caregiver Resource Centers we have in California, um, you know, area agencies on aging and see what might be available. Um, if you have veterans benefits, there are excellent um, respite uh, services available through the VA. Um, but yeah, you know, I think caregivers need time away uh people can get really stuck in the house um and so going to a day program is often an economical um alternative to paying for in-home care um there are some grants um sometimes available through counties or um, organizations for short respite stays um you know at a memory care assisted living um Yes, I, I think um, respite is an important piece. Um, right, and and um, part of that question is that she also asks, will it upset the routine of the of the patient? Um, you know, I think that's very individual. You know, each person with this disease is each person with this disease, and it's how we you know um, help the person acclimate to the different respite settings, whether it's an adult day program or overnight stay in a facility, home care. Um, and I think it's a case by case um, basis. So we do yeah, have. Yeah, I agree. And yeah. I would add that I encourage people to try it. Um, and, you know, and also to try it again if it doesn't work the first time. Because I think, you know, this is a, generally a really long course, uh, you know, eight to 10 years. And, um, you know, things change. So something that might not work at one point might work later. Right. Um, we. I know you said you'll spend a couple more moments. So we do have another question. Um, and these questions are great. Keep them coming. But uh, we will end in a couple of moments. Uh, we will just stay on for a couple more minutes. But at what point does a caregiver transfer their responsibilities to a hospital or nursing home? I'm not sure I understand that question. At what point that should a caregiver? Or at what point does a caregiver? Yes, I'm not sure if I understand that question either. I think if the person's going into a facility, um, that's vital for the family to sit down with the admissions coordinator, um, get all the legal paperwork, the policies, the procedures, um, to see what uh, the policies are in that setting. Um, and, you know, to find out what that looks like for each setting your person is in. If you have questions regarding the responsibility of the caregiver, um, they'll let you know. But uh, on this, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to answer that um, because each facility might have different policies and procedures. So I encourage you to speak directly to the setting at large. Um, 
we do have a I would also add that Uh adult protective services might be helpful in a case like that um, if a caregiver is really feeling overwhelmed and like they're unable to provide the care that someone needs. Um, Sometimes adult protective services is able to connect people with services they wouldn't otherwise know about or have. That's true. So we do have a comment. Um, Let me read this comment. I am so amazed that people fight to stay out of assisted living when this is an excellent option for people who need assistance with activities of daily living. The right place with the right people will help people stay more active and more independent longer. There are also ways to pay for this, such as VA aid and attendance, use of life insurance settlements, long-term care insurance, et cetera. Safety should be the number one goal. As a society, we need to have national conversation about this. Thank you for sharing that comment, Wendy. Um, So it looks like we are done with our questions. Thank you for answering them all. Um, I certainly learned some new information today. I truly do appreciate your time um, answering questions and also providing a wealth of information. Um, I want to welcome everyone back next month. Again, we will be having another presentation from one to two. Uh, Again, I want to remind everyone that our handouts are on the right-hand side, and you could upload them, print them, save them uh, as you wish. And the handout includes the PDF version of today's PowerPoint presentation. Sarah, again, I can't thank you enough, and I hope everyone has a good rest of the day and a good weekend ahead. Goodbye, everyone. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.